I've seen a lot of bad trades. It's pretty fucking up there. DeAndre Hopkins and a fourth round pick for David Johnson and a second. Hall of Fame caliber receiver in the prime of his career, 27 years old. You give him up for David Johnson and a second round pick. It's 1130 in the morning. Bill O'Brien made me make an old fashioned at 1130 in the morning. I'm used to pain as a Texans fan. I really am. Uh, we've had a lot, a lot of bad days. Very rarely do we have a bad day that's this confusing, uh, mainly because of how j just the, the pure like self-affliction of the misery. Well, really, it's more self-affliction on O'Brien's part. Bill O'Brien is doing this to Texans fans like me. He's making us feel this way because we know you know, all couple million of us Texans fans, we know how shitty this trade is. On some level, maybe he does too. But he's trading DeAndre Hopkins, again, one of the top three receivers in the league, who has been a top three receiver in the league for several years now, gonna be a Hall of Famer, trading him in his prime for peanuts, relatively speaking. There's only one reason why he would do that deal, because on the surface, it is so awful. And I will get into that reason soon. Um, but I want to do a couple other things first. Number one, something that I think is more important than football right now, especially with what's been going on over the last really more than a week. It's been a couple weeks now, a few weeks even. Um, I put out a tweet a couple days ago, uh, and, and this is me speaking as somebody whose grandparents, who are very vulnerable, uh, live eight hours away. I can't grocery shop for them because they live on the other side of California. You guys probably know I live in Orange County. They live up way inland from the bay. They're in the middle of nowhere. I can't shop for them. Uh, obviously, it's a nerve-wracking uh, experience for vulnerable people to be shopping right now, whether they're immunocompromised, elderly, whatever. Uh, it, it's, it's a harrowing experience for them to go out in public. And so I put out a tweet offering my services for any of you, if you have uh, an elderly or compromised person in your life that lives near me, that is afraid to go shopping and they don't have anyone around them that can do it or, or do it for them, I am 100% uh, totally willing to do it. Again, I've worked from home for three years. YouTube is my job. I don't have to go into an office. I set my own hours. I'd be more than willing to put a couple hours into working at night and then taking a couple hours during the day to go shopping for people that truly are scared to death of going shopping for themselves. So I want to reiterate that here and not just in the tweet because more people will see it here. If you have a family member that's in Orange County, California and they need help, drop a comment below. Hit me up on my DMs on Instagram or Twitter. Let me know what I can do to help. Um, again, this this whole crisis will, truth be, truth be told, is not going to affect me very much. Again, I work for myself. I work from home. Um, I, don't, I don't have an office. I don't have a boss. Uh, it, it, this whole situation is really more of an inconvenience to me personally. So if anybody should be going out and shopping for people, it should be me. It should be people that do fucking YouTube for a living. Like if there was one time that I should be doing this for people, it's right now. So again, let me know if you need help. Uh, and if you're willing to do the same thing wherever you live, um, maybe people, people don't have grandparents that live where I live, but maybe they live where you live and they need help. Uh, if you're willing to do that, drop wherever you live and any contact information you're comfortable giving out, whether it's socials or emails, whatever, do that in the comments below. Um, offer your services and maybe somebody else in this little film room community uh, could use help from you guys. Because I think now more than ever, uh, people that are young and healthy and certainly have the time to, like me, 
um, should be helping out those that, that can't or don't. Um, it's, it's incredibly important. So again, let me know if you guys need help. You guys have been there for me for the last few years uh, and given me everything that you see here. So if there's any way I can repay that by helping out your family at this time, again, more than happy to do that. Um, secondly, second little announcement before we get to Hopkins. I just started a podcast. You guys have wanted me to do that forever now, and I guess since a lot of you are, are gonna be home for a while and maybe need a little bit something more to entertain you, pretty good timing for a podcast, I guess. It's called the Bootleg Football Podcast, where we do essentially what I'm doing right now, which is sitting back and drinking and talking football. It's with my buddy EJ Snyder, which if you're a Bears fan, you're probably familiar with his work at Windy City Gridiron and uh, the Bears Over Beers podcast really knows his shit. I never wanted to start a football podcast unless I had somebody else uh, talking with me that like knew what they were talking about when it comes to like watching film and techniques and schemes and everything like that. And he is phenomenal. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine a better partner to do this with. He's a really awesome guy. Uh, and I think you guys are gonna love this podcast. Again, it's distributed everywhere podcasts are distributed. Uh, and I have a link down to our second YouTube channel the BFP channel uh, down in the description below. You know what, I, I think before I get into the Hopkins, I think I'm gonna roll kind of a little segment that we recorded just to kind of give you an idea of, of what it is. This one's about Isaiah Simmons and how to kind of best deploy him in a modern defense, whether it's a safety, a DB, linebacker, edge. Uh, really fascinating discussion. So I'll include that right now, just to kind of give you a taste of what it is. And then we'll talk about DeAndre Hopkins. One of the great questions in this whole draft class, is what the hell is Isaiah Simmons? <laughs> a lot of people say he's a free safety, strong safety, Will linebacker, Mike linebacker. Some people think he could be an edge rusher. So athletic, so long, why not? Yeah. You and I, when we kind of watched him together, we came to the same conclusion of what he is, what he should be, and maybe what he shouldn't be. So I kind of want, to, want you to walk us through first what really jumps out to you skill set wise that can maximize the unreal athleticism that is Isaiah Simmons. Yeah, to put this in context, Simmons played over 100 snaps at five different spots on the mm -hmm. defense. He played strong. He played free. He played outside corner. Wait, what? Uh, he played slot corner <laughs> and he played backer yeah. for them. So, you know, obviously a loaded talent team and a guy that plays that many spots significant number of snaps at all of them obviously it begs the question athletic freak uh read a thing this morning that they're probably going to rename the combine after isaiah simmons after he's done with it uh very very possible um his gifts are obvious on film he's tall he's long he's very fast he's instinctive um, but I think a lot of people want to shade him towards the back of the defense because he has that range and that length. So, mm -hmm. hey, let's play him at a big free safety or let's play him at a very versatile, strong safety spot. Um, Cam Chancellor is the comparison you hear a lot. Right. Yeah. And I think that's logical. But after watching him on tape, we came to a different conclusion. And mm -hmm. the one, the thing that I think he could do the best is put him at middle, no matter what you call middle. Right, Nickel is the new base. That's two linebackers. You can call him Mike. You can call him Jack. You can call him whatever you want mm -hmm. to. Put him in the middle. Put him between the hashes somewhere on the second level of the defense, not right at the defensive line. And draw him a big rectangle that goes all the way out <laughs> to the edges of the field and about five yards into the opponent's backfield. And that's his area of play. Yeah. Right? Let him go hunt because he's smart enough to do it. He's instinctive enough to do it. He's got the physical gifts to beat people that get in front of him to do it. His closing speed is unreal. It's It doesn't even make sense when you watch how fat, like, he'll start at one hash. The other guy's in the middle of the field. He's eight yards behind him, and he'll still catch him in the backfield. Like, his closing speed for 230 pounds is I don't, I don't know if I can count them on one hand how many guys I've ever seen move that fast at that size. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I said something that's probably going to upset a lot of people, uh, but it opened your eyes a little bit. And I think Isaiah Simmons is a slightly faster Erlacher. Same role, yeah. what you're talking about. And, and Erlacher you know? was a safety, a rover at, at New Mexico. 
and uh, came into the league. They started him a couple games at strong side just because he was so big. Now, Erlacher was bigger. He was 260. Yeah. And Still ran. Yeah. Super fast. Crazy like, freakish. Yeah. Um, Simmons is not that big. Um, doesn't hit that hard, but still hits with impact. But I think he's faster in closing to the ball and almost as instinctive yeah. in it as a guy coming out of college, comparing him to a guy that ended up in the Hall of Fame that had freakish physical skills and saying he might actually be a little bit faster. It's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. I'm not saying Isaiah Simmons is Erlacher. Let's get that out there right away. But in terms of the way he plays the game from that middle position, that middle alignment, that spot, that hunter yeah. in a defense... He's got that kind of potential to develop into a player like that. And you kind of mentioned, you made a good point when we were watching him, when I was like, oh, he's got the, spill, the, the speed to be a run-and-chase Will linebacker. And you made the comment, and you're like, why? Like, <laughs> put, put him at Mike. Let him make plays on both sides of the field. Yeah. You know, as long as you have a safety, not even a, a safety that, that is super physical, but a safety that can come downhill and spill. Like, you don't even need to use safety force. You don't even need to use corner force. Like, let your corners just cover. Because he's going to get to the edge faster than the back anyway. Like, you don't even need a force player with him, which is a concept that defensive coaches that watch this are going to be like, yes, you do. Not when you have Isaiah Simmons. Yeah, might not. <laughs> you know, you could, you could literally just have two big defensive tackles in the middle. You can have safeties flying down the field. You can have edges crashing inside and just obliterating tackles that all the, like they're used to just playing hinge technique and throwing them behind. No, have edges crash inside because if everything gets spilled outside, there is no running back in the league that I think can really beat him to the edge. Case in point, Etienne, who was a 4-3 running back at Clemson, who, in my opinion, should have come out this year, but he went back for his senior year. Fine, he wants to get his degree. I think he left money on the table, but I respect the decision. They were in a foot race together, and Simmons was step for step at 230-plus pounds. If Etienne can't beat him, how many other running backs in the league are going to beat him to the edge? Probably not many. No, very few. Very few people are going to match his physical gifts. And when we see players with physical gifts like that, the immediate thing we want to know is, do they know how to use them? Do they know how to employ them? He are, does. There, are their instincts going to take them to the right place? Because being fast and running to the wrong place just takes you out of the play faster. Mm -hmm. Simmons is not that guy. Simmons is a guy who is dialed, who understands, who reacts very, very quickly. And you couple that with the speed, the length, the physical nature. He is not a... Um, a shrinking violet, right? He mm. likes contact. And we made a joke that you could draw a little defensive line in front of him and say, okay, you play about a 10 yard, 10 yard wide and go forward and then just surround the rest of the field behind him in about a 15 yard arc <laughs> with defensive backs and say, nobody go in the middle. This is Isaiah's spot, right? This huge <laughs> circle in the middle yeah. of the field that's like a 15 yard circumference, right? Anything around him in that halo effect, he's going to get it. And, again, defensive coaches are going to look at that and go, that's not possible. It yeah, might it be. Is. <laughs> I mean, as long as as long as long you got guys that are eating blocks in the middle so that he can just work, Yeah. I mean, it. There, there's no better role for him. And that's kind of the reason why we, we think, can he play safety? Sure. sure. Should he? No. Mm. Because you want him around the ball. You want him at a depth that he can chase to the edges and make tackles for loss. He had, what, 16 tackles for loss or something like Some crazy number, yeah. which, in you know, like eight sacks, like just put him on the line of scrimmage, similar to how the Chargers use Derwin James, where he is yeah. on the line of scrimmage. He has the athleticism to carry the seam if you really want him to in that Pete Carroll-style cover three, which sort of looks like cover six, but it's not cover six, yep. where he has the size and athleticism to carry the backside seam. So the free safety really only has to worry about one side of the field. Plays the run to the edges, blitzes like a maniac. Like just do that, but more. And I think he could be a phenomenal player if you put him at safety. It'll work, but it's a waste. It really is. The other thing is he put up all those numbers, playing over a hundred snaps know. at five different positions, I including know. being fifteen yards off the ball, which we both said. If you want to maximize his impact at the line of scrimmage and behind the line of scrimmage, put him closer because he's got the range and the instincts to do that. Keep him clean and let him go. The other thing we talked about was Tampa 2, right? <sighs> Putting him in the middle of a Tampa 2, much like Erlacher <laughs> under, under the prime lovey years, yeah. right? You've got to carry 25 or 30 yards, and Erlacher could do it. Very few of the linebackers in the league can do that at that size and still play going forward. Simmons is a guy that has the gifts to do that. I'm not saying Tampa 2 is his best system, but he could but easily he carry that yeah. role. 
And it's get him close to the line of scrimmage, get him engaged, don't give him as much distance to go hunt those ball carriers, and he's going to hit more of them behind Mm -hmm. the line of scrimmage, which is insane. Yeah, I mean, he has literally the potential to be a top five linebacker, regardless of whatever label kind of linebacker you give him. He has the potential to be a top five linebacker the moment he steps on the field week one. And that is saying a lot because there's some excellent linebackers. Yeah. He's special. He's special beyond special. I think when people look at Carolina as the natural fit, and you made the the comment of you you put him and Shaq together, the range of that duo would be absurd. It, you almost don't need a whole lot else in front of them because the range they would have, you can't run outside on that. I no, and Nickel being the new base, if those guys are your two players on the field, we talked about this too. You don't have to substitute. No. Right? It doesn't matter what the offense Mm-mm. is going to do short of maybe a jumbo package where you're going to run right over both of those guys. But nobody in the offense world in the NFL is doing that right now. Yeah. Everybody's spreading the field. Everybody's going quick. Everybody's going small. You could leave Simmons and Shaq on the field and just be like, nope, we're good. Sub people around him. Keep the defensive line fresh. And that would be it. That would be your defense. It wouldn't be your base defense. It would just be your defense. But you throw in a safety like... Maybe even Simmons' teammate, uh, Kayvon Wallace, that can play slot. Yeah. And then you can run a 5-2 100% of the time, dare people to beat you with the run, which they won't. Yep. And then you have a whole bunch of defensive backs slash linebackers that can match up with literally anybody. I mean, good Lord, who wouldn't love to see that? I mean, that's a, that's a Matt Rule kind of pick if I've ever seen one. Yeah, it gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility. Wherever you put Simmons in your defense, we believe he should be in the middle at a mm-hmm. linebacking type role. But wherever you put that guy, he is a can opener on defense. Mm-hmm. He's going to allow you to do many things, line up in multiple fronts, slide him around. Can you slide him to edge? Heck sure, yeah. why not? Absolutely. You want to bring pressure? He's a great blitzer. Um, it's it's all good. So uh, he's a guy that is amazing uh, that we're so excited to see in the league, and we just hope he gets to a defensive coaching staff that is creative. Yes, because if he does get to that kind of staff, we're, we're looking at a potential all-pro out of the box, and there's only a few of those every single year. Uh, Yes, I love you too. There's only a few of those every single year, and and I think he's one of them. Mm. Okay, you're back. That was pretty good, right? Um, Fun discussion about Simmons. EJ's awesome. He really knows what he's talking about. And I am going to do a full scotch for breakfast just by myself. This is bourbon, not scotch. Doesn't really count. But I did want to address Hopkins individually since that's a very long kind of internal monologue for me because he's one of my favorite players ever. And I'll talk about the rest of free agency and all the trade, you know, the Buckner stuff, the cousin stuff, the Tannehill stuff, all the tags. I'll talk about that in a, in a much longer free agency episode. But for Hopkins, my theory of why this trade happened is he doesn't really get along with Bill O'Brien. Um, Hopkins, as great a leader as he is, he has a very strong personality. Because again, he's a, he's an alpha. I mean, he is alpha of the alpha. Again, he's he's been around the block. He's an all pro. He knows he's going to be a hall of famer. Like he he commands a lot of respect, not just for his own team, but around the league. Um, and he's he's kind of earned the right to be a big voice in that building. O'Brien doesn't like big voices in the building that are not his. He envisions the Texans being run much like the Patriots, where it's Bill Belichick's way or the highway, even above Tom Brady. I mean, that's Tom freaking Brady, and Belichick gets his way. And Bill O'Brien wants that kind of control. He's, he's, very, uh, he's a big believer in having one voice at the top, and any other voices below him, whether it's a coach, a player, a Hall of Fame caliber player, he won't tolerate it. Uh, there have been conflicts in the past with many players, both elite and not elite. I mean, DJ Swearinger lasted... Not very long at all under Bill O'Brien, who was just recently a second round draft pick, I think the year before O'Brien came. And he barely lasted any time at all because, again, he, 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 conf- he conflicted with uh, O'Brien's, let's call it leadership style. Uh, Clowney, again, wanted to be paid north of $20 million. O'Brien doesn't believe, not even just in overpaying, he very rarely believes in paying at value. Uh, so shipped his ass out too. Uh, Hopkins got one big contract out of O'Brien, but that was after a holdout, a one-day holdout, but still it was a threatening of a holdout. And then 
A couple years later, with the cap going up, supposedly there was talks that DeAndre wanted another big contract or at least a, a kind of restructure of it, much like Julio got in Atlanta where he signed a deal and then got more money. Uh, supposedly DeAndre, again, with the cap going up significantly, he wanted to be paid like he was supposed to be paid. Probably in the range of like the Michael Thomas deal. O'Brien's not about that. He will only re-sign you if you have one year left and that's it. Uh, he won't sign you if you have more than one year. And uh, not to mention the fact that, again, DeAndre is a very strong personality. O'Brien doesn't tolerate that. He wants people to fall in line and he wants to run his program like Bill Belichick. But the problem with that and the reason why I'm pissed at Bill is O'Brien hasn't earned the right to run his team like Bill Belichick. He hasn't won anything. Uh, he hasn't even gotten past the divisional round. He's never been to a... Ch every... This stat's mind-blowing. Every single other team in the AFC South since Bill O'Brien has taken over... Keep in mind, they've won the division the majority of seasons that Bill O'Brien has been the coach of the Texans. Every single other team in the AFC South has gone to the AFC Championship despite the fact the Texans have won the division most of the time. The Texans have never been there. Ever. And especially under O'Brien. They will only get to the divisional round and no further. And usually their losses are embarrassing. The Chiefs' loss is no exception. Up 24 points and you lose. Uh, how they lost to the Panthers, how they lost to the Saints. Um, I mean, getting absolutely boat raced by the Ravens. You know, this embarrassing loss after embarrassing loss after embarrassing loss. They haven't won shit. O'Brien has not earned the right to run his program like Bill Belichick, where people are willing to put up with his style of management, which is his way or the highway, people will put up with that if you're gonna win Super Bowls. The Patriots won Super Bowls, so players shut the fuck up because they knew they were gonna win. Every single year they had a chance to win a Super Bowl, so they dealt with it. Players don't wanna deal with that with O'Brien. They're, 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 not, they're, not they're not gonna win a Super Bowl with him, or at least it's very unlikely. The only reason that team's even competitive was because of Deshaun Watson, DeAndre Hopkins, Will Fuller occasionally when he's on the field, um, J.J. Watt when he was healthy, one of the best defensive players in the league still to this day. The only reason they were even competitive was because of the things that DeAndre Hopkins could do on the football field, and he traded him away. And I guarantee you that does not sit well in the Texans' locker room because they believe more in DeAndre than they believe in Bill. Guarantee it. I can almost guarantee you that Deshaun Watson's probably pissed, and keep in mind, they're going to be trying to re-sign him to a huge contract extension over the next year, year and a half. And if they ship away all of his weapons, his best weapon, why does he have incentive to play these games? Like, you, you can't run your team like the Patriots if you don't win like the Patriots. And the other teams around the league that win like the Patriots, whether it's Kansas City or Baltimore or New Orleans has had sustained success. They don't even run their ship like that. They are not as callous and, and control hungry as as Bill Belichick is and it, and to think that Houston under Bill O'Brien wants to run their team in that manner when they haven't earned the right to do that especially in the eyes of the players is fucking baffling to me and that's why I made this drink at 11:30 in the goddamn morning because I don't understand why Bill O'Brien believed that he could do this like wh what makes you think that you have earned the right to trade away one of the best players in the history of the franchise in his prime for David fucking Johnson and a second round pick and you give up a fourth round pick and believe me this is nothing against David Johnson when he was healthy early in his career he was a phenomenal running back but he hasn't been healthy in two years and he got outplayed by Kenyon Drake last year and we're taking on that contract and giving up a fourth round pick for the right to give you DeAndre Hopkins? I mean, Arizona got a, a, a monumental steal. This is one of the most lop lopsided trades that I've ever seen. It, I, it's, it's baffling, and I, I say that word a lot. It is straight up baffling. I don't understand it, it but in a way I do because I know what Bill O'Brien is trying to do. But the thing is he's fucking failing at it so bad in terms of establishing a culture, um, getting guys to buy in, why the hell should J.J. Watt and Deshaun Watson and all these other young players, Will Fuller, why should they buy into Bill O'Brien if he's trading away one of their top three best players 
one of the five best players in the history of the franchise when he's only 27 years old. Why should they trust him to run the franchise? Why should they trust him to take them to the promised land when he's been in a bad division? I won't even say bad. He's been in a very up and down division, uh, a kind of a revolving door division for the last 14, 15, 16, 17, eight, six years, whatever he's been there for, and never gone to the championship game when he's had so many opportunities to do it. You know, all you have to do is you have to go through Jacksonville, who had one good year. You have to go through Tennessee, who's only just recently started to come on. You've had to go through Indianapolis, who was highly inconsistent and almost entirely dependent on Andrew Luck over the last several years before he retired and then they fell apart. You know, it, it, it's, it, it shouldn't have been that hard to, to at least make one championship appearance in the last five or six years, especially in this division. It shouldn't have been that hard when you have J.J. Watt and DeAndre Hopkins and Whitney Merciless, who's had some really good years in his career, one of the more underrated 3-4 outside backers. You've had an interior uh, duo of McKinney and Cunningham, who are excellent in between the hashes. Um, you have a, a nose tackle, a DJ Reader is one of the best three nose tackles. You have a, a stud safety in Reed. Um, obviously, the offensive line's been bad, but you still had some really good weapons outside of Hopkins, like Fuller and uh, Duke Johnson, I think, is one of the more underrated running backs and has been for a long time, especially as a receiver. Like, there's so many pieces to this team, and you can't, you can't even get past the divisional round, and you think you can run your team like you're the fucking Patriots? Really? I just, as a Texas fan, it pisses me off because our window's done. It's straight up closed. Um, I, to be honest, our window probably closed as soon as Pat Mahomes was healthy. Um, they did get a win against the Chiefs, but again, Mahomes was banged up. Uh, their whole offense was banged up. We kind of got a cheap one on them in Arrowhead where we just ran the ball, and that was before the Chiefs defense kind of unfucked themselves in the middle of the season, which I did an episode on. You should go check that out. Um, and when they kind of changed things, uh, both schematically and personnel-wise, and kind of redid their system. Houston caught them at a time when they still couldn't stop the run. They can now. Like, I don't think that they realistically had a shot to beat Kansas City or Baltimore. Maybe could have beat New England because New England was heavily hampered, but like, their, their window closed. But one of the few things, one of the only things that realistically could have kept that window open was DeAndre Hopkins. Who are you going to replace him with? Will Fuller can't stay healthy for more than six or seven games a year. And he's phenomenal when he's on the field, but it's almost never. And, and you're relying on a second-round pick to replace DeAndre Hopkins? Like, if you're lucky, and, and this is, like, this would be unbelievably lucky, maybe Denzel Mims is there. Maybe. And that's one of the few players that could sort of, kind of, remotely, maybe salvage the situation. And again, I'm using that big capital M maybe because I love Denzel Mims, but he's not going to be DeAndre Hopkins immediately. He might not even be DeAndre Hopkins ever. And you're just hoping and praying that he's there in the second round because you somehow couldn't get a first round pick for DeAndre Hopkins? Really? You, you, San Francisco didn't pick up the phone? Kansas City? Baltimore? Any of these playoff teams that need like one more weapon to really like push them over the top? None of them picked up the phone? <laughs> And we're willing to give up a first round pick to make a run at it next year with DeAndre fucking Hopkins? Are you serious? And you think a second round pick is going to replace him? I just, I'm hurt. I'm really hurt. Like he's, again, I'm repping the jersey because he's one of my favorite players ever. Um, there's very few receivers that I have ever watched that have been so as delightfully violent as DeAndre Hopkins. And I don't know if we're ever going to see one like him again in a Texans uniform. Again, maybe we get lucky and we get Denzel Mims. In my wildest dreams, that's a possibility. But in no way is that worth the risk of giving up DeAndre Hopkins. Absolutely not. And I, I understand what Bill O'Brien is trying to do. I understand. He's trying to eliminate strong personalities that may or may not threaten his culture that he's trying to build, whatever the fuck it is. I get why he's doing it, but I don't think he's earned the right to do it, flat out. He's not Bill Belichick. He probably will never be Bill Belichick. And until you are Bill Belichick, you can't act like Bill Belichick. And I just, Texans fans should be rightfully pissed because it is, um, it's a fleecing. It really is. It's an unprecedentedly one-sided trade. It really is. Um, and it's going to take a lot of these to get over it. 
I, I think I already included the recipe for this, by the way. It is an excellent I'm sad drink. Uh, I love an old, a good old fashioned um, and nothing, nothing can kind of really take the edge off of uh, sports fan pain, like a little bit of whiskey and bitters and agave nectar. This is actually a recipe I kind of got it a little bit from the Educated Barfly. I modified it a little bit. You can check out his channel. He's a wonderful kind of cocktail and spirits YouTuber based near me up in LA. Uh, just six dashes of Angostura, a little bit of agave nectar. I think he used Demerara syrup. I used agave. Just It's still sweet, but I, I think it's a little bit less sweet and it kind of lets the bitter shine a little bit more for me. I like that balance better. And I use Woodford Double Oak because it's my favorite bourbon and it makes a mean old fashioned. So that's my recipe. Again, I, I think I already threw it up, but I'll throw it up again, just because I highly recommend that you make this, especially if you're a Texans fan that is in need of some comforting, uh, or really anybody that needs a little bit of comforting this week, because it's been a rough week, but especially so in Houston, because uh, shit's getting wild. So I'll be back soon-ish with uh, some sort of scotch for breakfast special on everything else that happened in free agency. Stuff that doesn't hurt me so bad, um, especially that Buckner trade is is really, really intriguing to me. I love that trade, but I'll get into that a little bit more when I do that special. So I'll be back sometime soon with that. I have another film room coming out on Joe Burrow. So I, I got a lot of stuff coming out soon here. Hopefully it'll keep you guys entertained during this whole quarantine and chill kind of uh, situation we have going on here. Uh, kind of weird circumstances, but as long as uh, as long as we have sports that we can talk shit about and drink whiskey to, we'll be able to get through it. So again, drop your information down in the comments below if you're willing to help out vulnerable people near you. Um, hopefully this community can kind of step up and help each other out in this really crazy time of need. And uh, yeah, I'll be back with the film room pretty shortly. So whenever that is, I'll see you later.